This is a shrimp boat. Below them, you can find some of the biggest, baddest fish in the ocean. Today we're chasing monster yellowfin tuna in the Gulf. They could be hiding anywhere, from the shrimp boats, to oil rigs, to wide open water. If we're able to actually fool one, then the real fun begins. These powerhouses can break the back of even the strongest fishermen. And if that wasn't bad enough, there are some other locals who like eating tuna just as much as we do. Join us for the challenge and the adventure of landing one of the Gulf's true monsters. Good morning, y'all. Welcome to the dock. We are loading up the boat, getting ready to go. It's like right before 4.30, and I am super excited for what we're about to do. Been out here two times before. Each time I fished this place, we have come into, or found some absolute monster tunas. So, that's the goal today. Find one of those monsters, and if we're really lucky, we might be able to do it on some really cool lures. And honestly, who knows what else we're gonna find out there. But. I gotta stop jabbering. We gotta load up the boat. We gotta get on the water. Why do you look so sad, my friend? We're going tuna fishing. I'm not sad. You're not sad? I'm, I'm saving the energy for later. All right, we'll, we're gonna see it. Heard it here first. So, we are actually not the only boat going out today. There's another boat going out, and we have a bunch of guys from the trip last year. Jack is gonna be on the boat. Brad is gonna be on the boat. I'm going on their boat. No, you're not. Screw you. If you guys could see, Victor's actually hiding under all these clothes. He looks like the kid from the Christmas story, but I think he's got a fever or something. You, you look like the Michelin man. We also have the old man of the hour, Mr. Sean Lawless. You guys might remember from our time in Panama. And I'm gonna say this, if you guys catch a bigger tuna than I do, you can pick any lure out of my box that you want, <laughs> whatever it is. So last year, my man Dennis got one of the most epic drone shots I've ever seen. A literal yellowfin breaching out of the water, eating my popper. So we're gonna need you to, you know, like do something cooler than that this trip. Well. <laughs> It's going to be hard to do. <laughs> it's going to be really hard to do. But if not, we'll just throw that footage into this video and pretend like it happened today. <laughs> We're just going to reuse it every year. <laughs> no, you guys are watching it right now. It's absolutely epic. It's crazy what this guy has to do because he's photos, he's videos on a camera like this, he's drone, he's GoPros, he's underwater trying to do it all. TV, they get like four of these guys. And YouTube, just one. Man, one man army. <laughs> Later, nerds! And we are off. I'm gonna take a nap in the beat bag. As we slowly started to come to the end of our two hour commute, Captain Kurt set his sights on the first shrimp boat of the day. This one started to empty its nets, and so we knew that there might be some stuff underneath. So we pulled up here to this shrimp boat that was just letting out. We're pulling up their nets, throwing out their bycatch. And we haven't seen anything pop up on top yet, but did just mark some good stuff on the depth finder. So I'm actually dropping that uh, eight inch NLBN, the heavy jig head, kind of down. See if we can entice something to bite right now. Come on. Oh. oh! Yeah. Oh! Yeah, I might have got cut off. Felt kind of sharky. <laughs> Thank you. 
So we just pulled out here and there's a bunch of shrimp boats, some still shrimping, some still not. And there's tons of birds working up overhead. So Kurt wanted to take a sec, look around this area because it's a very similar area to where they found tunas recently. I also wanted to point out how uh, adorable we all look in our matching pelagic gear. Pelagic actually sent gear to all of the anglers for both boats. A bunch of cool stuff, literally all the way down to the t-shirt underneath. Mine's all the way to the underwear. You got pelagic <laughs> underwear? I didn't get any <laughs> underwear. I'm just kidding. But yeah, I thought that was pretty cool that they would send us all out gear for this trip. So if you guys are interested in anything like that, we have a couple links below. So at nighttime, these shrimp boats drag their nets and they collect most of their catch. During the day, they pull up their nets, at least in the morning, like you're seeing them do right here, and they sort out their catch. They keep all the shrimp and they throw back all the bycatch. All that bycatch is what's gonna attract tuna, sharks, and pretty much every other predatory game species. So taking advantage of that natural feeding frenzy, that natural chum slick that's coming out of the boat is exactly why we're, why we're here. And we're hoping that the tunas are here as well. Yeah. All right. So we just drop down the NLBN because Kurt marked some stuff. I got cut off by a shark once, saw a shark. So not super confident <laughs> that this is something that we want, but you never know, it got eaten pretty quickly underneath the shrimp boat. So maybe we'll see, get a look-see, see what we got. They didn't like those motors. Oh, there he is. We got color. Man in the gray suit. What? Yep. Well, that's a. Uh, that's one way to warm up the tuna mussels in the morning is uh, pull on the wrong species, but now we're ready for the right species. So as I lost my second lure to a shark, we decided it was probably a good idea to get some bait from one of these shrimp boats. Thanks, brother. So now we have a nice bag of chum, courtesy of the shrimp boat. Once we get on the tuna fishing, or once we find a nice pot of tunas, we'll be able to bring them up to the boat and keep them with us when they're feeding on top. So fingers crossed. Now all we got to do is the hardest part, and that's find the tunas. All right, boys and girls, major key for any good fishing trip. Ooh some good food we got that good good chick-fil-a what we got a little buffalo sauce i see reese's in there don't look at the reese's Shh, don't tell them about the reese's bro but this is legitimately the breakfast of champions we did this on my last louisiana trip and i'm hooked i'm always going to be packing chick-fil-a sandwiches from now on I caught an 80 pounder. 80 pound black tip shark. Hey Jack, I got a present for you. Yeet. <laughs> so here's the game plan right now. We just pulled up to an area called the Horseshoe that a bunch of guys fish is known to hold tuna. Kurt, it's got that big bag of chum gonna start chumming and he's also gonna start chunking on some bait rods. I'm gonna drop 
the eight inch no live bait needed, which we were very successful on our, my last trip to this area. And we're just gonna try a bunch of different presentations, see if we can get these fish to feed. Ideally, we wanna see them feeding on top because what Victor and I love to do is catch these things on poppers, see them on top, see them explode. But I also wanna catch them in any way that's possible. So that's what we're doing right now. So I kind of lied in that last clip. With Victor and Brooke both fishing the NLBN, I decided to do more traditional slow pitch jigging just to see if a different presentation would entice a bite. I did get hit pretty quickly, um, but I just got my assist cord snipped on this drop by what could have been a kingfish, barracuda, or a wahoo. Had some teeth marks left in the jig as well. Pretty soon after Brooke and I both hooked up, she ended up having a really big Jack Crevel, and I thought I had a tuna for about the first 10 seconds of this fight and then quickly I started to realize this was not a tuna this was another shark my third of the day I was just really starting to attract these things oh, yes, definitely... <laughs> <laughs> hooked in the side too dude look I got him in the peck fin oh so we left the area we were just fishing in after I caught that shark Brooke caught a jack. Now we are back. I don't know how well you guys can see it. The area where the shrimp boats are. Pull up here. Me and Lester look in the water and there's like 50 sharks just chilling. I don't really want to drop anything and lose another lure, but don't know what's going to be here. So we're going to give it a second, see what we find. Oh, we got some sharks. Oh, we got some sharks under here. Look, y'all. Hey. Oh, hang on. I can say y'all, I've never been in a place where the sharks are so fired up that they're constantly trying to bite the GoPro as I stick it in the water. Um, this is not a place that you want to dive. This is not a place that you want to jump in. The chum from this shrimp boat that they throw out constantly has these things absolutely chum drunk. They're gonna try and bite anything you throw in the water right now. It's kind of crazy how they can act like that. And then other times when I fish for sharks, I can't get them to eat anything. It's honestly wild how different they can act. We spent the next couple hours trolling around and looking pretty much anywhere that Captain Kurt thought there was going to be tuna. And it just didn't seem like we were finding much of anything. The ocean just seemed pretty desolate for lack of a better term. Oh. <laughs> All right, so check it out. While we are waiting for the tuna to come up, I'm gonna drop this jig. We are on some pretty solid bottom right now. Possibility they could find a grouper, so drop down and see what happens. I think I do, what the hell? <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> It's like that doesn't feel like the jig. I was like, that doesn't feel like the jig. It ain't very big. It might just be like a bee liner or something. Oh, we got a rare species. <laughs> well, we are very deep to catch these right now, but we caught 
a tiny little American red snapper. Got a little barotrauma right now from being pulled up from the bottom. It's a little bit puffy, but we're gonna get him back down to the bottom because this is way too small and they are out of season right now. So these guys, when they're around, they'll eat a little bit of everything. There you go, Brooke. Brooke's on, big on, big on, a big on. Oh, I just got whacked too. Come on, come on, eat it, eat it. Oh, everybody's on. Oh. All right, the whole boat just hooked up. Oh, two on one hook. Get out of y'all. I caught. One jig with two hooks, caught two juvenile amberjacks. I think that's one of the reasons why we like coming out here because when the tuna don't want to play, there's always a lot of bottom fish around. And we're not catching a crazy big quality or anything like that, but it's crazy action here. Double up, two fish on one jig. Victor hooked up in the background. Plenty of fish to go around, plenty of stuff to keep us entertained while we wait for those big tunas to pop up. If you guys have been seeing these crazy trips that I've been getting to go on over the past year, year and a half, a lot of those have been supported by Saltwater Sportsman Magazine. They've been partnering with creators like me to send us around the country, around the world even, to do epic trips, bring you guys along for the journey. And Saltwater Sportsman Magazine has, you know, really just been helping us out and making it happen. So we have this mutually beneficial relationship. So it's really been awesome. I've actually written a couple articles for Saltwater Sportsman, been featured in my very first big tuna with them, was featured in an article. So if you guys are ever interested in subscribing to Saltwater Sportsman Magazine, super cheap. You guys can check out the link in the description. You can check out this QR code right here. And there's actually a chance to win an amazing brand new boat, a Solus boat. All of that info is linked below or through the QR code. You can find all that info. And man, honestly guys, for as cheap as it is, all of the info that you get, all the online articles, all of that access, it's a really great value. So check them out, they support me. So I absolutely wanna shout them out and support them. So if you guys are ever interested, check them out. Now let's get back to fishing. Okay, so we definitely just marked some tunas. We've been riding around looking for them. So I'm gonna drop the eight inch NLBN. This worked really well in these types of conditions when I was here last. So we'll see what happens. I'm also gonna chunk a bunch of dead baits, some chum, just try and get these fish to cooperate. Be the right kind. Doesn't feel like the right kind. Uh -huh. Does not. I don't think so, but very, very much seems like shark head shakes to me. I am good at jigging sharks apparently. Oh. Yeah. Who knows, Kurt? Who knows? 
There's only one reason I'm still fighting it, is because I'm not positive. Whew. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I hooked up on the no light bait needed, and initially, I was like positive this was a shark definitely still could be but the thing is is we're fishing bait right now we're fishing dead chunks we haven't hooked any sharks so i'm holding out hope that this could be a really big tuna that thing's moving fast and we're starting to get tail beats tuna ate my shark that's what happened y'all <laughs> All right, I need to scoot. Can someone move this jigging rod, please? I'm coming around the front of the boat, please. There we go. Okay. Sorry, guys. Man, that thing just made me do a roundabout around the boat. So what's got me thinking that this could be a tuna is purely just the speed that it started to take off with now. How angry it's been. Not that sharks can't swim fast, man, but tuna seem like they're on another level. And if someone like Kurt is driving the boat for me while I'm fighting it, that tells me that he thinks it could be one too. Because if it was a shark, he'd just be letting me fight this thing here <laughs> in pain in the back of the boat, suffering in silence. We'll find out in a few minutes. Lester, do you have an opinion? It could be anything. <laughs> no telling. <laughs> they don't seem as hopeful as me, but I'm the one on the rod. So I probably have a little I bit more hope. I brought them in out here and I thought they were sharks and they end up being tuna and sometimes we think they're tuna and they're sharks. Especially if you catch a hammerhead or something like that that runs, makes a good run. But this fish was running hard, so I don't know. Hey Vic, or Dennis, just one of you come help me real quick. Wine on this thing for three seconds. We gotta strip some layers. Gain anything you can, my Man, friend. It's definitely not a tuna. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't small. Yeah. How many layers did you just take off? The <laughs> All the layers. Fine, I got maybe like five inches on it. <laughs> Ready? What the heck? Did this thing get heavier? <laughs> I literally started sweating from like <laughs> 10 seconds. It was right around this point that Captain Kirk started to get excited because this thing really started to act like a tuna. You can see subtle little tail beats in the rod that are very indicative of a tuna. And this thing started to do what's called pinwheeling, so circling underneath the boat in consistent circles over and over again. And y'all, the most common thing that a tuna does, especially a big one, is put your boy in pain. Because these things are so big, so strong, and man oh man, fighting them on a spinning rod, even a properly suited setup like I'm using, will absolutely kick your butt. I actually have sized up my gear like significantly from the last couple trips that I've done with Kurt. Typically, I was fishing 14,000s. My first trip, I was actually fishing at 10,000. Now I'm fishing a Saltiga 20,000. I'm fishing some Silk Ocean PE8, which breaks at 108 pounds. And I'm fishing a new 7'4 Diablo uh, Beast Rod, which this is just a absolute tuna stick tuna killing machine but at the same time as nice as your gear is the big tuna don't care how much money you spend on it or how nice it is they're gonna make you earn every inch <laughs> yes. 
Going back again, Kurt. Huh? Going back towards the motors. Just say. He's gonna make a big circle. Yep. Yeah. Time they pump their tail, you see the end of the rod. Do do do. Every 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 pump, you see that end of that rod. Oh, I'm starting to feel the pain now. Tell you guys that gain in line when I can. This thing's spinning in circles like the right species should. I actually like it a lot better than the fish, the rod that I fought fish on last year. It's a little bit more bend. I don't feel like I'm going to break it when I high stick it as much, which is not what you're supposed to do, but I'm getting sloppy because I'm getting tired. <laughs> I hope it's not a shark. Ryan definitely earned this fish because he has pulled on like three or four sharks today. And uh, hopefully this is the right species here. Uh, all right, Vic, where you at? He looks like a magnum, baby. Come here, I gotta take these sweatpants off. Come on. Oh! I'm gonna drag you. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting oh, down short. He's getting down to his whitey tail. Makes it get freaky on you. <laughs> <laughs> They are. Under the boat, under the boat. Yeah, loosen it a little. On, under towards the motors. I, I, yeah, I almost cooked it. It happens, but the fish went under the boat. There's nothing happens to anyone when you're fishing heavy drag. The next 15 minutes were just pure pain, discomfort. Um, just stubbornness from me and this fish it honestly didn't seem like either of us were gaining all that much anytime i would gain some the fish would gain it back i started doing super weird things to get any leverage here um i, th I don't know uh if this is a preferred method or not but uh it actually started to work and then the fish would duck underneath the boat again yeah. and i'd have to do something awkward with the rod and this tight drag did not really allow me to do all that much, but just hold on for dear life and make sure the line didn't touch the gunnel. And for the first time in my tuna fishing career, I actually handed the rod to Vic to just straight up take a two minute break. I felt like I wasn't gaining any on this fish and being in such a sharky area, I wanted to put maximum pressure on this thing and get it in as fast as possible because there's always that chance that a big shark can come in and just ruin your day. But after that short break, I was right back in the you saddle. Got the front. I got it. Got color. Tuna. tuna. Big tuna. Ready to harpoon. I'm going under the boat, under the boat, under the boat, under the boat. I back the boat. And I just gas back there. Be on the other side of him. <laughs> oh my god, Kurt. Look at that big bastard! I told you! I told you, you little bitch! <laughs> <laughs> That's what we came for! Oh my god! Don't want to gas him too big. 
Yeah, we don't want Victor going swimming. I told y'all that was them when we marked them. You mean like too deep in the water? Yeah, we don't want yeah. to gap him down too deep. You got the gap up? Or you, yeah, I got it. you got it, Victor? Grab? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Oh my god, dude, I can't believe this. Why can't you believe it? I can't. Who are you on the boat with? That's true, <laughs> man. Come on. Look at you. So <laughs> and remember me saying, are you sure that's a shark? Uh, <laughs> Maybe ask him for a lot. Either or, whatever you want. Sun on the side? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, I would say no on that one. <laughs> Is that the biggest yellow fin you ever seen in your life? Fuck. He's got two of them! One yeah. on both sides! <laughs> oh yeah! Whoa! Yeah. Alright, get... Hey, watch out! Let him like you back there. Yeah! Ready? Right. Bean bag behind you, don't trip. What's up? Oh my god. What the f***? Brooke, I'm like, abs I'm in disbelief because yeah. of how hard it fought and had the emotions of like, is this a shark? Am I caring too much about this? Or is this, could this be a massive yellowfin tuna? Absolute donkey. And this thing gave us its all. Absolutely gave us its all. But let's get him up on our lap, show you guys. Anybody who's ever fought a big fish on a spinning reel knows what a workout it is. I was on the rods for five minutes. Ryan fought it like a champ for like 25 minutes. He poured his heart and soul into this fish. <laughs> this was, we've caught tunas this size. I would say this is the hardest fighting tuna we've ever encountered pound for pound. It thing kicked our ass. You're gonna be able to hold him if I let no, go? No, he's gonna slide. Absolutely one of the hardest fighting tuna I've ever dealt with. Took a team effort. My man Vic helped me out a lot. My man Captain Kurt put us on him. Drove the boat like a pro. We got this fish in the boat. Absolutely stoked for it. Probably over 120 pounds. Might get a weight on it later. What do you guys think it's going to be? Comment down below right now in the video. Absolutely fired up. Smoked that NLBN. And that Diablo rod you guys saw me use. Worked like a champ made by Ocean Devil. I'm just absolutely fired up for this fish. I'm smoked, I need a bottle of water, but there's more tunas to catch, so we gotta get back out there. That was absolutely wild. The sun is getting low, we gotta start heading back to the dock right now. Could still run into some fish, really don't know what we're gonna see out here, but we gotta head back there, so bundled back up, got cold again, and uh, I'm gonna eat a little bit of food. And cross our fingers hopefully we find a couple more fish on the way in but otherwise that was one heck of a fish we're gonna get a maybe get a weight on him at the dock okay guys we ran into a little issue last night and that was that these fish were so big that we didn't have coolers to put them in couldn't leave them on the boat because Kurt had another trip he's actually out on another trip right now so what we had to do is knock the heads off knock the tails off so we could put these cores on ice keep them firm and fresh for now when we're getting these filet videos. I want you guys to look at how crazy these fish are. So one of the things that I always deal with when I'm filleting a tuna is they're very hard right up here, right around this dorsal fin. And that's just from all of the muscles, all of the tendons that they use to move and maneuver. They not only can pick this up like any other billfish, push it down when they need more speed, they're also able to move these crazy um, sickle fins and all of these little individual, yeah, I don't even know what these are called, but these little individual yellow fins, they can use an angle in order to chase prey and move really gracefully through the water. So I think at this point, I'm just gonna approach this like uh, any other filet. <laughs> One or two. Mm. 
These things are so big, heavy, and awkward uh, to move around. Really a different animal. Now I'm gonna try and, basically what we're doing is we're quartering this thing or breaking it into quarters. So you have a top loin and a bottom loin on each side of it. So if you guys kind of look right here, there's this line and you can actually see very well because we've taken the head off of this thing. This is where that bone is, that's where that bloodline is. So we're gonna try and go on the top of that and go all the way down this tuna. making sure that I'm separated down here as well. You guys ready? We'll see how we did. Oh, bang, there we go. And that will always be the best looking one, even if you're not a pro like me. That'll be the best looking one that you get. And all the rest of them that you take off of this tuna carcass, they're not gonna be as pretty, they're not gonna be as aesthetic, but. So now what we're doing is we're processing the loin. So as opposed to skinning the entirety of this loin, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna break it into sections, cut down pretty much all the way to the skin, and then start to angle the knife sideways. And there we have a big old chunk of tuna. Now I'm passing this off over to Brooke. She's paper, she's paper toweling it off, getting off any little scales, any little bits of just whatever. We're not gonna rinse off these fillets. We're putting them straight from the loin to the paper towels, to some Ziploc bags and getting them back on ice. You never wanna rinse off your saltwater fillets, especially not something like tuna. So you just wanna dry it off, you know, take that extra step to dry it off to help preserve your fish. And this is a beautiful chunk of tuna for some steaks. And then we got some big Ziploc bags that we're going in. And we're gonna be taking home a lot of fish. Yep, so we have a ton of work to do. We still have a whole other tuna carcass to finish up. So I'll actually see you guys back in Florida for an awesome tuna dinner. Welcome back to Florida. I'm gonna have to apologize if I sound a little funny. Um, Victor was just so nice to all of us that he decided to get myself, Brooke, and Dennis all sick with whatever he had going on. So just bear with me uh, that I sound a little bit funny. I'm not feeling too hot either. But the show must go on and we're gonna have to make dinner one way or another. Right now, Christina is at work. So the goal is to have a nice dinner prepared for her by the time she gets home and you guys will come along for the journey. Tonight's recipe is going to be a fairly easy poke bowl. Basically, I'm starting out with a marinade for our tuna. So I'm gonna do like a quarter cup of soy sauce, eh, maybe half a cup, close enough. Add some rice vinegar, maybe a little bit more than a teaspoon, maybe a lot more than a teaspoon some sesame oil, a little bit of red pepper flake. I'm gonna add in some green onions. If they're not gonna look like this, they're finely chopped. Add some sesame seeds and mix all that together. This is what our tuna is gonna marinate in. So a lot has happened for me in my life in the past year, basically since the last, or since the first tuna trip that I took um, with Captain Kurt last year, my first experience, you know, doing one of these saltwater sportsman adventures. And I kind of wanted to talk to you guys about some of the things that I've learned over the past year or so, as you, you know, kind of monotonously watch me chop up this tuna into smaller cubes. I've basically got like 
we'll call them five lessons that I've learned over the past year and then one little bonus at the end. Um, first thing that I would say that I, I really had reinforced in the last year is that when it comes to getting things done or you know doing things that need to be done, there, there's never going to be a perfect time for those things. Like, uh, I used to always imagine in the back of my head that there was gonna be some perfect moment when it was like, okay, now I have the free time to do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, I think maturing is realizing that that perfect time is never gonna come. So you just need to make the time or you need to do the things that need doing no matter what. And if the things don't need doing, don't do them. There is no amazing rainbow or end to the rainbow where magically you're just gonna have all of this free time and you're gonna be able to do all of these things that you told yourself you wanted to do. The second lesson would be, is a little bit more skills based. And that is that you really don't get better at whatever skill you're working on unless you're doing that skill. Like thinking about it, writing about it, researching it, that's all well and good, but you're never actually gonna get better at the thing until you do it. So whether that's actually fishing, you know, getting better at your casts, getting better at your presentations on how you work, work a lure, um, whether that's, in my case, something like video editing or storytelling, you can watch how-tos all day long, and that's all well and good. It's gonna give you some ideas, but until you decide to go out and do the thing and suck at the thing, you will not actually get better at that thing. There we have all of our tuna, nicely cubed into bite-sized pizza pieces, pizzas, into bite-sized pieces, and we're gonna let this marinate in the fridge for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, as long as it takes me to get everything else ready. So there's one thing I did forget in the marinade that I really wanted to add, and that is some fresh ginger. A pro tip that I learned literally today via Google was to put this stuff in the freezer, and that way it grates a lot better. And it seems like it's working. What I love about doing poke bowls like this is Really, all the work is is just making rice, which I did that off camera, marinating the tuna, which you just saw, and then just chopping up some different toppings, whatever you really want. And it's completely up to you on what you want to do. What I'm doing pretty simple tonight. Just doing some green onions right here. I'm cheating completely. Got some shredded carrots as well, so less work there. Next up, got a couple cucumbers. Now I'm trying to think, in a poke bowl, what would look better? If I do it like circular cuts in a cucumber, you know, like the things that girls like put on their eyes, or should I like just stem it out and make them like long, almost like straws? I feel like I'm just gonna go with the circles this time and we'll see. So back to our list. The third thing that I would say I've learned or been reminded of in the past year is there's always going to be opportunities. In the, in the last year, I've had hundreds of opportunities thrown my way. And that's not to sound bragging, like, like I'm bragging, but it's to say that most of those opportunities are, are really just distractions. And I had to reinforce my no muscle. I have, you have to say no to most of those opportunities because they're really just distracting you from the things that actually need to get done, the things that you actually want to get done in order to achieve your goals. And there's always gonna be that nice, shiny thing that sounds like a great idea, um, but those shiny things pull your focus away from the things that actually matter. So saying no to 99.9% .9 of those opportunities, maintaining focus is definitely superior than just getting distracted by the next shiny object. And I'm not perfect at this at all. And I get distracted like everyone else, but 
I've always found that I'm better off when I just default to no and focus on the things that actually do matter than when I pick up, oh, this sounds like a good idea. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Focus. Focus is definitely the key. Do you guys know how difficult it was to find ripe avocados? Literally, I, I swear, I was looking for like 20 minutes and they all felt rock hard, but lucked into finding a couple that might actually work. So number four is when you're working towards a goal, or at least when I've been working towards a goal, the way forward, um, like the long-term path, might seem, uh, not might, usually seems very unclear. And it's pretty much pretty overwhelming when there's not a direct path, especially in a career like this that I'm in. There's not a, you know, a five-step process to work your way from entry-level position to executive position. It's, you know, you're making it up as you go. Working towards that long-term goal might seem, can seem overwhelming. It, it seemed overwhelming for me in the past. It's just, you know, you're looking 10 years down the road at what you, where you want to be and you think, how, how am I going to even get there? There's so much to do. But while that can seem really unclear because of how much has to get done, what is usually pretty clear is the next step. Just the one next thing that I need to do to get where I need to be. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of silly when you think about it, but just doing that one next thing allows me to move on to the thing after that and then the thing after that, as opposed to try to imagine what step number 100 is and just focus on step number two and then step number three and then step number four. And somehow that allows me to, you know, clearly and, you know, more confidently get things done. As with any poke bowl, base is gonna be some sushi rice. And then we just put on whatever toppings we want. So call this one Christina's, this one will be mine. We both kind of like different things, so hopefully I don't jack hers up. But both of us definitely like some cucumber. Go in with some shredded carrot. Also coming in with some pineapple. I wanted some mango originally, but the grocery store didn't have any. I was all butthurt, and then I was like, I had got home, and I realized, you know what, pineapple would work, but I didn't have fresh pineapple at the house, but I did have canned pineapple. So, we have some canned pineapple chopped up on here. On Christina's, I'm gonna go in with a little bit of seaweed salad, and some edamame. I'll do a little edamame in mine as well. And for mine, I like some avocado for sure. Before we add the tuna, I'll cover lesson number five that I've learned in the last year. Lesson number five is that a dream doesn't have to stay a dream if there's a clear path forward. I'm starting to see a path for things that I never thought possible. And I'm starting to take the steps to achieve those things. So as opposed to these things being dreams for me, now they're just becoming goals. And I think that's true for most people, or this can apply to most people. You know, unless your dream is to become, you know, the richest man on the planet and travel to Pluto. Like, those things are a little bit unlikely. But if you have dreams that have some sort of steps to attain them, or someone else has already attained them, you know, there is a path there, and if there's a path, it's really not just a dream, it's it's a goal, and it's something that you can work towards, and something you can do. Bum, 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 bum. We have our tuna that's been marinating for probably over half an hour now. And we are going right in to the center of these poke bowls. Kind of overloading. I need like a, I need a better bowl. I need a better bowl for making poke bowls for sure. 
And lastly, I'm just gonna top this guy with some green onion and some more sesame seeds. This might be the first time that I've gotten done preparing dinner before Christina actually got home from work. And uh, if that's not a testament to how quick and easy making Poke Bowls is, I don't know what is, because normally this stuff takes me forever. I know I said that there was five lessons that I've learned over the last year, but if there was a sixth one, and there is a sixth one, I don't know who I'm kidding, this would absolutely be the most important one. And that is, no matter what's going on in life, in terms of career, you know, money, goals, people remain the most important thing. That's in terms of, you know, romantic relationships, friendships, family, professional relationships, the most important thing is people. Because no matter what you're able to do, accomplish, see, experience, if you're doing it alone, or if I'm doing it alone, I'm not enjoying it. I, I need to do it with people that I love, people that I enjoy, and when I'm doing something, yeah, I get so much more satisfaction out of knowing that someone else is getting something out of it as well, not just me. And I don't know if I said that clearly, I don't know if any of this list makes any sense, but if you guys have watched this far into the video, I, I do appreciate you listening to my ramblings. And Christina should be getting home any minute, and that's a good thing because I am starving and I can't wait to eat. So after a long day of dealing with sick people in the ER, now Christina has to deal with her sick boyfriend. Anyways, how's your Poke Bowl look? Um, incredible, I've been thinking about this for the past like six hours, so. Excellent. Got a little bit spicy mayo, little eel sauce, eel sauce. Mm -hmm. More and enough. some Sleepy Girl Mocktails. Non-alcoholic mm -hmm. cocktails. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna dig in. Okay, whoa, big yawn. Poke Bowl's down, it is late. We are both super tired. But I wanna thank you guys so much for watching this video. It was one heck of an adventure. I was kinda sad that you weren't able to come. Okay. But I was happy that you let me get out there on Valentine's Day. <laughs> Videos like this are always really special to me because it's almost chasing the pinnacle of fish, especially on spinning gear and getting to do it with one heck of a crew and, you know, working so hard for it and having it finally come together just makes it extra special. If you guys like this video, I guarantee you're going to like this one. So I'll see you guys over.